Um, anyway, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Christian Schock. I'm a Google Cloud Developer Advocate. I'm going to be talking about how to build uh, workflow type applications in AppMaker. Um, quick show of hands, how many people here have already tried or worked with AppMaker to some degree? OK, so we got some familiar uh, folks here. Uh, hopefully, what I show you today will give you a little bit more insight on uh, what you can do with AppMaker. Here's another quick poll. Uh, how many people here are more management side, like IT decision maker, as opposed to developer? OK, so yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I expected as well. So I do have technical content in the uh, demos and in the presentation, but I'll just keep that in mind so it's not purely just like a technical walkthrough and things like that. All right. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been around for a couple of years now, uh, working in, in a couple of different Silicon Valley companies, um, software engineering, product management, um, technical program management, uh, and then now uh, cloud developer advocacy, um, and basically focusing on Google AppMaker these last few years. Uh, I was actually the first PM for AppMaker when it was an internal 20% uh, project. and. Uh, it was actually kind of a, a neat experiment that our, our CIO at Google had uh, wanted to see if, if we could build a, uh, a technology that would allow um, people to essentially help themselves in building like these uh, smaller to medium-sized applications that uh, wouldn't, wouldn't really fit. They wouldn't really work with like a traditional engineering um, uh, resources behind them. So it just wasn't economically viable. And so with this product, you know, AppMaker basically was to essentially help mitigate or dampen uh, shadow IT and get everything under kind of like the same technical umbrella, so to speak. And, and this product itself was also, you know, blessed by our privacy and security. So there was no issue of any kind of random uh, weird stuff that any 20% uh, Google or engineer could uh, create on their own. Um, so in that sense, that, that's what led to the beginning of AppMaker within our corporate engineering department. And I helped, you know, get us to, to the point where we could actually feel like we had a, a viable product. And we launched it internally a couple of years back. And then, then that began like a, a, another journey as well as we worked our way towards uh, doing our actual launch. So the goal of this session basically is just to kind of walk through you know, introducing AppMaker for those of you who uh, are a little bit new, explaining kind of high-level concepts of what are the, the goals behind it. And I think I touched on it already. Uh, and then just drop into a, uh, a demonstration of how to build uh, applications in AppMaker. And so I have uh, some stuff that I'll just build on the fly. And then I have like a, uh, a specific demo that I created recently that I'll share with the community. But it, the goal was for this particular demo that I, or sample app, I guess, was just to show how uh, you could build like a, a document workflow application without uh, having to get so uh, deep into the code. And so this will complement the existing uh, document workflow example that we already have in the product. All right. So these are the general topics I'll be discussing, um, kind of pretty straightforward, talking about you know, a little bit of background. Uh, I will talk about some of the use cases that we've seen uh, in various enterprises, uh, starting with Google. And then as we've launched our trusted tester and early adopter programs, we watched a lot of our customers and partners building like a number of different use cases as well. And so that all kind of factored into the evolution of AppMaker over time. And then I'll finish it off by just building or building components of like a, a workflow application right here on the fly. And I'm glad I have network connectivity as well, because that was a bit of an issue. <laughs> um, so first of all, what is AppMaker? So it sounds like people are generally pretty familiar with AppMaker uh, at a high level. Um, I, I, the thing that really kind of speaks to me is that it's, it's an empowering uh, technology. It's not just another tool for software engineers, but it's a tool that will uh, empower a whole variety of different types of developers. Uh, and I say developers lightly. I mean like professionals that have the need to build uh, a variety of different applications. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, it, it essentially supports the notion of citizen developers such that they can help themselves. Um, and so in this case, um, so yeah, like I said, it's not just a tool for uh, another tool for software engineers, but it's it's more of like a a, a technology that 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 can help a variety of different uh, users and personas. 
So this, this little bell curve kind of sums it up nicely in the sense that, um, sure, there's the, the, on one side, the, the technical side, there's you know, full on full stack developers, they can use AppMaker. If they understand CSS, JavaScript, HTML, SQL, they can make AppMaker do some awesome things. <laughs> um, but on the, in, on the more like the, the general middle uh, audience there, I've seen, I've encountered, I've worked with a number of different uh, professionals, and they were like, you know, business analysts. They were like researchers. Uh, we have people in the educational in the er areas um, where they have like the, a day job where they're working with data, but they happen to have this need to build some sort of like a application, whether it be like a workflow or some sort of like a reporting or a dashboard. Um, that's where they find the most value uh, in AppMaker. And of course, as you get less and less technical, you can still do some things with AppMaker, but but it really kind of depends. Like it, having like a little bit more uh, or prior experience to maybe some legacy technologies, Lotus tends to come up, uh, or there's other uh, various productivity tools out there that that uh, are f somewhat familiar that people can kind of learn how to use that maker without too much pain. All right, so let's just take a quick look. I'm going to have to unlock my screen, so give me one second. All right. So this is just a, a real basic um, starting point. I actually created a new app based off of this starter app template. So these are known as templates, basically examples that you can get started. Um, and I did do some s slight customizations, like I changed the uh, color of the header. That's pretty trivial. I mean, you can go in and, and do the CSS directly. Um, but for this one, just to kind of give you a feel for what what it's like to work with AppMaker, uh, you typically you have like our on the on the left side. Oop, is it a little bit cropped? Well, yeah, we are a little bit cropped. Um, unfortunately. Uh, as you can kind of see, there's like data, pages, and scripts. And essentially, you, you, you build out your database under the data tier. You, um, you build out the UI, obviously, under pages and scripts for any custom code. So in this case, let me just go ahead and pop open the, the widget palette, drag and drop a button onto the screen. And I might want to generate a little bit of code. So this is like a script generation wizard. And I just have like a function there. And I can go here and double click on that. So this is like really kind of intro stuff here. And then I can go over to the property editor on the right side and change it into doing like a custom action. So in this case, I'll just call this function that I just created. And then to test it, I click on the preview button. And that sends it over to the server. And then we have this little button there. And I click on it, and it says hello. And it happens to grab my, my particular username. So that's just kind of a real small teaser, but just to give you uh, an idea of what you can do with AppMaker. Um, let's go back to the slides. So also, I wanted to kind of step back a little bit and talk about some of the use cases that we've seen in the real world and kind of help set the context. So over the last you know, year and a half, two years, we've been working with a number of companies and helping them with their various use cases. Some of them are more recent. Um, I know, like for example, we had ATB, Veolia uh, join us on stage on Tuesday. Uh, Clio's right there. Uh, we had a great time basically helping them work, uh, help brainstorming, looking at their use cases, and they had a hackathon. Uh, these are kinds of things that I really enjoy, going out and meeting the different customers and helping them be successful. Uh, but in general, like I've seen a lot of a lot of familiar patterns, and starting from our Google experience and then how that kind of transcended over into the outside world. Um, for the most part, the applications that I see that tend to be built are, are either like dashboards or tracking uh, applications, uh, and then a variety of workflows. And so um, like a training workflow was, uh, I can think of one in, in particular where um, there was like a, an initial uh, initiative to build something from scratch using Cloud Platform, uh, but it ended up being much more economic, economically feasible to just build it in AppMaker since it was basically a, a straightforward workflow application. Uh, and then, of course, document workflows. That's a very common uh, pattern that we've seen so far. And so in order to kind of get into a little bit more of the meaty stuff with AppMaker, I'm just going to kind of give a, uh, a general technical overview of AppMaker, and I'll dive into like the, 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 the main uh, technical artifacts as well. So first up is the architecture. Uh, 
albeit this is somewhat simplified, but you know, at the top you have like your editor that's being served to you through a browser. It's coming from Cloud Platform, and it's just what I showed you a second ago. It's like you have your developer environment. Um, it's all working within a browser. There's no SDK downloads or anything like that. The, the most, uh, I would say, supported browser environment is Chrome. That's the majority of the Q&A, but other browsers uh, do work with, with AppMaker as well. And then from a server standpoint, when you actually click Publish or Preview, that, run, that basically takes your application, it bundles it up, sends it over the wire to the server, and that's running in the AppScript environment. And once you're on the AppScript environment, you have access to all of these different services, all the, the things where you can like, create docs, edit docs, fetch data from sheets, send emails, Etc. And so it's a very rich environment for the server that you can have. And this is where the real magic of like, cool workflows can come into play. Uh, and then finally, since AppMaker is more of like a traditional database application or web application environment, there is the, the notion that you're going to have like a primary database that you're working with. And so right now, we have Cloud SQL as the recommended uh, default database. Uh, there are other ways to access data. And this is also an area that we're looking to uh, continue to expand. So there, there will be other options as well. But for today, uh, the Cloud SQL option does provide the most secure performant um, uh, database that you can build for enterprise applications. Um, and of course, you can also step out even today using uh, just uh, REST APIs, uh, JDBC. Uh, there's a JDBC connector within AppScript that you can go out and talk to databases, like MySQL just natively. Um, you do have to do a little bit more scripting if you go down that path where you create essentially your own data access objects, which starts to get into more coding. All right. So I, t I touched on those three main technical artifacts. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail, obviously, with these. So on the data side, you know, your goal is to essentially use like this declarative data modeling environment to build your, your model objects and then set up like the, the queries that go against and fetch the data. Um, the UI itself, as you saw, it's like drag and drop. You essentially open up a widget palette, pull over whatever UI constructs, and then you can go to the property editor and set any uh, properties as needed. You can set up events to kind of trigger, such as when you click on things or when the, thing, when the actual UI element loads. Uh, you can set all that up to execute whatever you need to. And of course, the, the kind of the glue that makes like more, I would say, sophisticated workflows possible uh, or customized behavior is within the scripting. And, um, and the scripting is kind of like the, the magic that makes everything all, all work as you would expect it. Now, you can get away with doing some very basic applications without any code at all. You could build like a CRUD database application. So if you know what that term is, you could create, say, update, uh, replace, delete, uh, and even search without writing any code as well. Um, so talking about models, um, this slide kind of shows like a typical uh, transition where you're coming from like a spreadsheet or a CSV file. You can then pull this into the AppMaker model editor, um, have the structure of the spreadsheet be replicated into a, a data model. Um, we have like a nice wizard that will scan through the, the spreadsheet or the CSV file that you upload and, and give you all those fields for free. Uh, you can then on your own customize further and add additional fields and such. Uh, another uh, very important concept to know is uh, data sources. Data sources, in short, are just like queries that go against your models. And so whenever you create a new model, you'll have a default data source that does like a select star and pulls all the data out. And it will typically have like 100 uh, records that it pulls out at a time. Um, but then you can also customize these data sources to set up uh, further filtering. And typically, in a real application, you're going to have multiple data sources going against a, uh, a particular data model. So that's an important concept to know. Um, and relations, this is another very powerful feature with AppMaker in the sense that um, you, you don't even need a relational database, but you can, as long as you have your models, you can uh, set up relations between those two models. And they pretty much follow standard you know, relationships, so one to many, one to one, many to many. Uh, and you do it in a, in a visual sense. So you just put them side by side, and you can set up the, the quote, arity. I think that's a term that, that tends to be used sometimes. Um, for this particular demo or application that I built, I'm not actually using relations, but um, you can see plenty of other examples of how to use it. All right. So let's go ahead and jump back into the demo. And for this one, I'm going to start building a data model. So um, just to kind of set the stage, actually, maybe is there a way that I can? I guess there's no way to kind of uh, decrease the uh, the the um, 
the demo screen a little bit so we can see the left side. Oh, anyway, I could go, uh, OK, I'll just go ahead and keep plowing away here. So, so for the data model, uh, over there on the top left, there's a little plus button. I'll click on that. And I'll go ahead and set up the, um, oh, before I do that, let me just show you really quickly. This is going to be the source of my data model. And this is very typical, like a, uh, a workflow within a spreadsheet. So you've probably seen that. It's, it's kind of like a natural behavior to do that. Um, so this, in this case, it's like a document workflow um, implemented within a spreadsheet. So there's like a, you know, things like the document URL, very important. Um, when do you want this to be reviewed by? Um, has it already been reviewed and approved or not? Uh, and then, who, of course, who you want to actually review it. Um, so yeah, so this spreadsheet will serve as kind of like the starting point for our data model. So I go over here, I click on the plus button, and I'll just accept the default Cloud SQL setup that I have for my particular domain. Uh, I can talk about that more depending on time, but basically this is like a, a step that you'll want to do if you want to set up Cloud SQL as the default. And then let's see, I'll set up, I'll name this review request. And this is the little button that I'll click on to allow me to go out and search the Google Drive for the spreadsheet that I was just showing you. And it scans the spreadsheet, and I can see that that matches what I want to create my model from. And then based off of the, the data within the spreadsheet, it will essentially deduce what kinds of data types that we want. It will also generate the field names appropriately. So you can see string, number, date, uh, Boolean. Those all look pretty good. So I'll click Create. And then now we're in the data model editor. Um, I can customize this further. So for example, maybe I want to make the uh, the, the doc URL field, I want it to be required. Um, I could even change the, the, this is a SQL specific feature, but I could change the, uh, the type from varchar to text. It will give me a little bit more room to work with. So I'll just change the SQL type there on the fly. And there's even other stuff I could set up regular expressions for, for validations and such, and even put in the error message right there. Um, let me do one more customization. I'll go into the priority. And this is a number. And for this, I'm going to go ahead and just limit it to four possible values. So I click to set the value here. It's a little list editor. And I'll just set it to one through four. And that's it. So my data model is good to go. I can actually build an application with that. Also, if I click on the data sources tab, I do have this default data source, which will serve as my interface to my data. If I wanted to customize the query, I could go into this, this little uh, entry area here. I can change the number of records that it returns and so forth. Also, automatically load data. Whenever you view the page, it will automatically fire the query. So pretty straightforward stuff. Um, anything else I want to show? I think that's probably good enough for now. So th I'll, I'll come back to the demo in a second. But so just getting back to the slide, so you saw in just a few minutes, I was able to take a spreadsheet and turn it into an actual workable data model. Um, Moving ahead, let's talk about the UI. So the UI is relatively straightforward. There's you know, three main artifacts there, like you're working predominantly with, with pages. Uh, pages are essentially containers where you can put these UI elements uh, known as, or we refer to them as widgets. Uh, the widgets themselves have all properties. You can bind the widgets, like a text box, back to a data model field, and then it stays synchronized. Uh, so you don't have to write data access code to actually do the synchronization. It all handled for you. Uh, page fragments are just reusable uh, UI fragments, like header, menu, footer. Um, and, and you can customize. You can build your own. And whenever you build your own page fragment, it will then show up on the widget palette. Uh, so you, then you can just drag and drop it onto your uh, UIs. And then pop-ups, that's another uh, cool feature that's been, uh, it's relatively new, but it provides like a whole bunch of different types of dialogues. So ranging from like a simple empty dialog to like a loading or a, a snack bar, like a little thing that will pop up and give you a message. Um, so these are actually pretty fun to work with. And, and I'll show you how to, how it's pretty easy. Now, for, from a design and data binding, there's some key things to know. Uh, as you can see, it's a Google material uh, look and feel that's built in. Um, but that's not to mean that you can step away and do your own UI design. You can totally do that. You can just turn off uh, the, the styling, and then you can go in and build your own CSS look and feel. What I see typically, though, is people are, are very happy with the material look and feel, but they just might tweak it a little bit or select some of the various uh, different style variants. So we provide like a number of styles that you can select uh, on a 
widget by widget basis and have like a button rendered in like a circle, like a fab button or whatever. And so that's just kind of point and click at that point. Uh, and there is also a very helpful CSS editor where you can type in some code and then it will do code completion and allow you to do some you know, somewhat advanced CSS code without really having to, to, to really be a CSS expert. But it, it's, it helps you along. And of course, the data binding feature, an extremely powerful feature that, as I mentioned, it's, you can go through, data bind any types of elements or properties on various widgets and then have them connected back to your database. And it's not always just a data, data model field. It could be like an expression of concatenation of server-side data that then gets sent down and connected to your front-end UI. All right. So switching back to the demo. And um, all right, so now I'm going to go to the UI. So again, this is the UI that I used the starter app. There's not really much going on here. Um, so for this one, I'm going to build a table that will allow me to track all of the document review requests. And so in this case, I'll just pop open uh, the widget palette. I'll drag and drop a table. And it will just define, and I'm going to set it to the same default data source. And I'm going to have a couple of things show up. Uh, let's see. I don't need the comment. Reviewer approved. And it's probably good enough. Oh, maybe I will put back approved. And then I'll accept the default options for generating the table. And so now we're looking at a design time view of the table. It's basically a repeated row. Um, we have, in this case, we have uh, just labels. But if I made it editable, I would actually have uh, you know, drop downs or date pickers and so forth. All right. Now, the other thing I want to do is add a button so that I can then launch a, a, a dialog to insert new data. So in this case, I'll just drag a button onto the screen here. And for this one, I might change it to say add. And when I change it to add, I can actually take advantage of the fact that uh, Google Material has these keywords that allows me to use an icon. And so by putting add, it actually changes it to uh, when I render it as, a, uh, as, a, as an icon, it, it shows up with a little plus button. Uh, likewise, there's like other things like Fab Mini right here. And then so there's my button. And what I want the button to do is when I click on it, I want it to launch the pop-up. So to do that, I go over to the property editor, I go to my on-click property. And I just scroll down here, and you'll see that there's the option for show pop-up. And then I have the create request a dialog. I don't think I showed that yet. But basically, I have this pop-up here called create request. And it's just empty at the moment. But I'm going to fill that up now. Um, I, I, I used the, um, the pop-up wizard here to select. And I, I just selected the empty pop-up to, to, to do that beforehand. And so now I'm going to drag a form into there. It's going to be like an, an insert form, right? So this is where it gets fun. So I can drag the form, same as before, same data source. I specify that I want it to be insert. And I don't need all the fields. I just want the primary stuff there. Um, the due date, I don't need the approved. The reviewer, I need, and the comment. So that should all line up nicely. And that was part of the reason why I pre-built the the dialog such that it's, uh, it will fit nicely. So now I can go in and customize my form. So now, the, as you can probably guess, pushing or making someone such that they have to enter in a URL is kind of a painful thing. So in this case, there is a nice little drive picker widget right here, which I'll just drag and drop right here onto the screen. And then again, I can change this, the text, to be an icon. And so I'm going to use the keyword drive, and then I turn the style variant over to icon, and now I have that nice drive. But also, as you can see, it kind of shifted everything down. And so this is where you want to start to get into a little bit more, oops, um, I would say flow layout types of features, where you can, you can define different panels that have uh, certain uh, flow, I guess, associated with it. So in this case, I selected a horizontal panel, and then everything will just kind of snap together in a horizontal fashion. So I'm going to pop this up inside of that panel, and then I'm going to take the, uh, the doc URL and drop it right inside there. And now I just want to stretch it out so that it will not just fit to content, but I want it to fill parent. 
There it is. So and everything shifted over nicely. Now to make the drive picker widget actually do something, I need to set some properties. So we have here the selected doc URL. And that just means once I pop open the drive picker, uh, I want it to actually send that into my field, the doc URL field. Right? And then for the other one, selected doc name, I go into here. And I just associate that with the doc name. So that's basically the, the, how data binding works. All right, so now these should work OK. I have priority ready to go. It's actually a drop down, which will show me the four values. I have a date picker for the due date. Uh, the reviewer is one more thing I'm going to add to it. Let's just pop that up right there. I'm actually going to add a new uh, widget, which is better than just a straight uh, text box. So in this case, it's a user picker. And this will actually connect to a. Uh, directory uh, service that I have in my environment. And it will create a directory model for me as well. So I'll click Create. And as you can see over here, I now have this directory model. I have all these fields ready to go. All right, so then if I go back to my dialog, and I can just change the prompt. And I just need to set the value. So I data bind the value to be bound to the reviewer field. Right? And now I can just toss the other one. All right. So pretty straightforward stuff. And the final customization is I want to make it such that when I click on the submit, it will create the record, but it will also close the dialog. So right now, the on click behavior is to create a new record or a new item. I'll pop open custom action, so then I can uh, customize the behavior. So in this case, I will add a function that will get triggered once this first call is done to create the new record. And this is where I can use that, that client-side um, API for the UI. So app.popups.createRequest.visible. There we go. Uh, yes, there we go. Visible equals false. So that's just a simple way to, to close the, uh, the pop-up. All right, so pretty basic stuff there. Uh, I can do the same thing for clear, but I'll just make sure I have enough time to finish everything up. All right, so I'll click preview, sends over to the server, and with a little luck, I got the, uh, the behavior that I want. All right, so here's my empty table. I click on the plus button. There's my dialog. I have my drive picker. That opens up a, a window here, and I'm going to just select the presentation that populated the doc URL, the doc name, and then here I can type in a few characters, and that should pull up my name. So it looks good. I'm good to go. And then I can select priority, and I'll just use the date picker and put it two days in advance. And then if I, my code works, it will close the dialog, and now I have created a new record in my, my database for a essentially to trigger this application to start a workflow. Now, the next step is actually implementing the workflow part, which is actually a little bit more uh, coding, but uh, I'll get into that as I switch back to the slides. And in order to implement the workflow part, this is, as I mentioned, the, the scripting part. So at, at a high level, just to review, scripts are two flavors. One is the client side, you know, works in the browser, just straight JavaScript. This means that you can write your own JavaScript. You can import uh, any kind of third-party JavaScript library, uh, jQuery, whatever. Um, and then there's also some APIs that AppMaker provides, such as like a data API to insert, update, delete, all from like your, your client, as well as like um, UI manipulation showing pop-ups, dialogues, navigating to different pages. And then, of course, on the server, because it's running on an app script, you have access to all those libraries. And that's really kind of like where you'll uh, be able to implement the, uh, the workflow, in this case, like sending emails and such. Right? So just to give you a really quick demo, if I switch back to the, uh, The demo? OK, cool. So to get started with, with scripting, it's pretty straightforward. You click on the plus button. Um, in this case, I'll just create like a, an example, say hello. Uh, and then maybe I click on another. And this time, I want to generate like a server-side script. And then I could even rename them so I kind of keep track. There we go. And I think this one was client side. Yeah.
And then if I wanted to, instead of calling this alert, I could actually just have it script.run. And there you can see server say hello. And that's actually the bit of code that would go from the client, call the uh, server side script, server say hello, which is located in this little function here. And that would just like to re return back to whatever's calling it. Um, and so I won't go into too much more detail. Uh, all that's in a very short sense. That's how you kind of get uh, busy, you know, how you can uh, be productive with uh, scripts and stuff like that. All right. So I'd like to switch back to the presentation. And we're going to kind of finish it off by talking about the overall workflow. Cool. So just to move on, um, one of the things that I did do for this particular talk was I, 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 um, I wanted to create like a, a relatively straightforward or easy to understand uh, workflow application, like a document workflow. Um, so if there's folks out there, you might have already looked at the template application, the document approval workflow. And that's, that's all good. It works fine. Um, but it can be a little bit daunting if you're not um, not so uh, if you don't have so much experience on the coding side. And so what I wanted to do with this particular application and this talk is just kind of explain, step back a little bit, and kind of uh, take it apart. And so that's what I ended up doing. I built this like relatively straightforward workflow or document workflow application where um, it has kind of like those five different steps. I've already done like the first three or so. Uh, we're right about step four where I want to have some scripting to uh, once I you know kick off the uh, the uh, the process to build a new request, it will then send an email to the reviewer, and then that person will then be able to follow through and, and either approve or, or reject the, uh, the the particular workflow. All right. So for that, uh, oh, just a you know, here's another graphic just explaining what's going on, um, and I'll actually walk through this application as it's working uh, first. I'll give a quick demo of, of it working, and then I'll walk through like the different components that make this possible. But as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. Sends it off an email. The reviewer gets it. He can click on it, and then he or she gets it, <laughs> and then he can click on click on the link and uh, be able to go to a um, approval page and either you know accept it or what. And then there's a couple data updates, and then it goes back to the requester, just letting um, him or her know that the that the workflow has been completed. So pretty straightforward. So I will show you how it works. So this is like the cooking show. I was debating whether I wanted to do it all from scratch, but uh, it's a little bit too much to do from scratch in, in the time I have. So in this case, I'm just going to walk through the application first off. So to do that, let me just, so here's the application. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty similar to what I had before. I have a table. I have a little button there to kick off to create a new record. I have the create request uh, dialog. And um, I also have this approval page. And I'll get into a little bit more of the details of how that works. But that's basically how the end user is going to, they'll get the link and they'll go back to this approval page to, uh, to, to either approve or deny or whatever. All right, so for this one, let's just kick it off here. I'll click Preview. And while it's loading on the server, I'm going to make sure that I don't have any emails here because I'm going to be referring back to this email application. So I'm going to close down this window so I don't get confused. All right, so here's our workflow application. I'm going to pop it open. I have my little same UI that I created from scratch before. And the dry picker window will, I'm just going to do like a, a review of my presentation. And I'm going to set up the reviewer again as myself. Um, I guess ideally I could have like two different people, uh, but you get the idea. So anyway, there's my my data there. I can set up the due date as maybe two days and set up a priority as one, whatever. So I will click Submit. Now I have this record here. But at the same time, I will go back here, and I see that there's an email that popped in. And the email says, oh, you know, greetings, reviewer. You have been requested to review the following document. And in this, there's the actual URL of the application itself, as well as the uh, actual record key as a parameter and then the actual page for the approval. So then I'll click on that, and that will take me over to this page. And there was notice there was like a quick little flicker where it pulled in the right record. I can explain that a little bit more in detail, but that's basically how I can locate it. And there's even some security settings that you can lock it down so only that person can see this record. Uh, but anyway, I will put in a uh, comment. 
looking good. I'll click approve. And that will go ahead and update the status of that particular record. And if I want, I could go back to the main page here. And now I can see that the approved is now signaling true. But more importantly, I can go back to the, uh, the email. And I should have a new email sitting there. So it says review complete. And then now I can see that you know, the document here, which is my presentation, has been reviewed. And it's coming back with, uh, as true, being approved. And it's looking good. Now, I deliberately kept this simple. I could have made a nice, rich uh, HTML page. But for this, I just wanted to kind of convey the, the basics of uh, passing on some of these uh, you know, values uh, in the emails. All right, so that's essentially the entire cycle or the, the workflow in a nutshell. Let me go back to the, the actual application to explain how it works. And so there's a couple, couple things that are triggered when a new, or the, the, basically the workflow gets kicked off right when you create a new record. So on the events side of things, on the after creation of a new uh, review request, there is this function here, share link via email. And I'm passing the, 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 the actual reviewer's email. Uh, and I pass the doc URL as well as the record key. And that's actually critical, because I want it to be able to make sure that I'm synchronized with that. So this is a server script. So I have it right here, share via email, right at the top. And let me see if I can zoom in a little bit, see if that works for you guys. OK, cool. So this is the thing that gets called right when the record gets created. Uh, I generate, essentially, the URL that I want to pass to the uh, end user or the reviewer. Um, I'm using a little bit of app script to get the actual URL. And then I tack on the provided key. I send over. I also attach on the approval page. So that gives them the ability to go back to that approval page that I've created. Right. And then here we are at the approval page. Um, so. This is triggered. There's like a very important step uh, when, it, um, when it gets fired off in that it will, let me just pull up the uh, events here. There is this on attach event. So basically, when the, the, the UI loads, it will call this parse record key param. And so that's on the client. And that's this guy right here. And there's just a little bit of code here just to to grab the, uh, the, the URL coming in from the request and just double checks to make sure things are OK. And then it actually loads the, um, the, uh, the appropriate record. And it's doing this by uh, grabbing the, the record key that's also been provided and then doing a load on the data source. Now, you notice that there is this custom data source. Uh, I haven't showed that to you yet, but it's, it's a different data source that allows me to fetch a specific record based off of the record ID. And so just to kind of return to that, I have my data sources. And there it is right here. And this is where I have a little bit of scripting to essentially grab the record key and return that specific record. And there is a parameter that I've added, um, record key, which then allows me to kind of stitch it all together. Uh, this gets into slightly more advanced. Uh, you have to kind of read through like what is like the difference between query script and query builder. In a nutshell, there's just like you can write your own scripting to return records from the data source, or you can just write straight, uh, well, relatively similar SQL code to fetch your, your, your data. All right. And um, that's essentially it. And that will allow us to view the contents on this page. And then when someone clicks on approve, for example, or deny, it's basically calling this function here, finish approval. And it sends either finish approval as true or false. So you can maybe see it off to the right side right here. And then that finish approval is a client side script, which is here. So we got the widget, which is our connection to our data source, so we can do data operations. And then we have the actual Boolean value for the approval. And so here I'm just like doing a quick uh, update, changing the, uh, the, uh, the, the field. And then I'm doing a script uh, run to email the response back to the, uh, the, the, the reviewer saying the review has been complete. Or the, um, uh, yeah, in this case, yeah, the, the reviewer complete. And that's uh, pretty much it. So let's see if there's anything that I wanted to touch on. So yeah, it's, um, it does take a little bit more coding to get that final um, the finish the loop, so to speak, but that's pretty much it. Um, any, I guess we can flip over into questions. I'm right about on time. Um, 
So I wanted to make sure that you guys also have all of these links. Feel free to take a picture, or you'll get the slides. Um, there's a relatively simple code lab that is relatively new. Um, if you have some newbies getting started, before subjecting them to the full-on uh, template experience for all these advanced templates, just doing that simple code lab, which walks them through a basic uh, data model and UI uh, creation. Um, and then, of course, there's the other stuff that you can do, like you can join the forum. Um, and of course, if anyone doesn't have AppMaker and you're looking to get AppMaker, you just have to uh, G Suite Business or Enterprise and EDU as well. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, other docs and things like that that you can, you can uh, jump into as well. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out early Thursday morning after Wednesday. Hope you had fun watching this uh, early morning demo. So, all right, thanks.